Well, a warm welcome to today's talk. It's Friday the 14th of June and today I want to give some more uh, depositions from the congressional hearings in the United States that are on the 3rd of June. We're going to hear from Mr Morgan Griffiths, the congressman from Virginia, and then we're going to get some context from Dr Robert Redfield, who led the CDC. And this is about the emerging consensus, as I see it now, that the SARS coronavirus 2 arose in a laboratory through gain-of-function research, as I currently understand the balance of evidence. And this is so important because it means that these viruses have been jiggled around within a lab. And uh, that's resulted, if this, if this is correct, this has resulted in a leak, it's resulted in a pandemic. How many other viruses have leaked from labs in the past? How many viruses could leak from labs in the future? The potential to make viruses that are so pathogenic, it could kill huge percentages of the people that you infect are there. If, the, if this research is still going on, it really needs to be stopped or at least made transparent and completely uh, completely controlled. But just before we do that, let, let's have a look at the background, the material that we've been fed, unfortunately. Uh, the famous Proximal Origins papers from 2020 was the first one, published in Nature Medicine. Now, this is still available. You can go onto the site and you can download it now. That's what I've just done about an hour ago today, the, the Friday the 14th of June 2024. Still not taken down. So it's still there. Um, our, our analysis, this is direct from the paper. Our, anal our analysis clearly shows that SARS coronavirus 2 is not a laboratory, not a laboratory construct, uh, or a purposefully manipulated virus. Although the evidence shows that SARS-CoV-2 is not a purposefully manipulated virus, we do not believe any type of laboratory based scenario is plausible not plausible. This is what we were told at the time. More scientific data could, data could swing the balance of evidence to favour one hypothesis or another. Yes. Obtaining related viral sequences from animal sources would be the most definitive way of revealing viral origins. Now this is four years later and it hasn't happened. We do know that there's been studies looking for this and it hasn't happened. So if this had been a natural um, spillover event, then what you would expect, natural spillover event as opposed to an event where it just happened to arise a few miles away from one of the world's main laboratories where they were researching and experimenting on these viruses. But if it was a natural event, then it would have got into an animal reservoir. It would have gone from animal to animal and it would have uh, potentially emerged into human. There would have been several crossover events as it went from animals into humans. Firstly, the animal reservoir has not been identified. Secondly, there was only basically one or at most two um, out, um, initiations of, of the pandemic. The initial outbreak can go back to one or two cases. Here's that paper here, just in case you think I'm making it up. It's uh, still there, still uh, available. So um, time has gone on and the evidence that could have been there is not there. Now, the second paper that we want to consider is this one from the uh, Lancet. This is also a fairly famous uh, or infamous paper now, whichever way you want to describe it. And that uh, is this one. Statement in support of the scientists, public health professionals, medical professionals of China combating COVID-19, which, of course, we would want to do. This was 2021. We stand together. These are the authors here. I've uh, put them there. But do check on the link for yourself. As I've said, that's the paper I've just shown you. It is all there, available for reading, and you can even download a full PDF if you would like to. We stand together to strongly condemn conspiracy theories. So this is an a priori rejection. It's a conspiracy theory. If you don't agree with me, you're a conspiracy theorist, suggesting that COVID-19 does not have a natural origin. So any theory saying that COVID-19 does not have a natural origin is a conspiracy theory and should be condemned. We support the call from the Director General of the WHO, direct from the paper, to promote scientific evidence and unity over misinformation and conjecture. Well, yes, of course we want to promote scientific evidence. 
But I think we can argue about what is uh, misinformation and uh, conjecture. Now, I want to go over now to um, listen to uh, Mr. Morgan Griffiths, who's the congressional, congressional representative for Virginia at that healing, uh, hearing um, on the 3rd of uh, June. I now recognize Mr. Griffith for a three minute statement. Good morning. I want to again thank the leadership of this committee for including the Energy and Commerce Committee in this hearing. Dr. Fauci, the recent revelations that Dr. Morenz, a senior advisor, and your chief of staff, Greg Folkers, routinely evaded federal records laws, including the Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, and those were a shock. That was a shock. I've been doing oversight now for over 14 years, or right at 14 years, and the scale of the effort to evade FOIA by some at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, or NIAD, has surprised even me. These men were among your most senior and trusted staff at an agency you led for nearly 40 years. They worked for you for decades. Your calendars show that you met with them multiple times a week during the pandemic. You co-authored dozens of papers with Dr. Morenz. He directly implicates you, even the head of the NIAD FOIA office, was apparently in on some of this conspiracy. And I know my colleagues on the other side love to say we're always talking conspiracy, but when the facts lead you there, whether you knew about it or not, when the facts lead you that your agency was involved in some form of a conspiracy related to COVID origins, we have to follow those facts. It is hard to believe that all of this occurred without your knowledge and or approval. In civil law, when one party has destroyed or refuses to produce evidence that's within its possession, a jury is allowed to draw an adverse inference that the information destroyed or not produced was unfavorable. Therefore, until we get a full accounting of all of the communications among NIAD's leadership, it's reasonable for us to assume that missing information would mirror the private doubts expressed by so many virologists and other scientists related to your public positions. While telling the public, the media, and Congress that COVID-19 almost certainly emerged from nature, experts you convene, convened as a team privately worried that a research-related incident was a possible, if not the probable, origin of the virus. Dr. Christian Anderson even said in February of 2020, quote, I think the main thing still in my mind is that the lab escape version of this is so friggin' likely to have happened because they were already doing this type of work and molecular data is fully consistent with that scenario. Further, while you and other NIAD officials were assuring us that the virus could not have come from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, NIAD didn't actually have an idea as to what the full scope of Wuhan's coronavirus research was or even the trajectory of its gain of function research. Now that may be because EcoHealth wasn't giving you the reports, I grant that. But this joint investigation has shown just how little oversight NIAD does of risky experiments involving potential pandemic pathogens. NIAD set up a system designed to green light potentially risky experiments while avoiding HHS department level review. The same program officers who act as advocates for their scientific area are responsible for assessing whether experiment is too dangerous. That creates a conflict of interest. I think that means that when we're taking, when an agency is taking the final approval, we ought to take that final approval away from the agencies like NIAD that fund it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Well, there we go. Uh, Mr. Morgan Griffiths, Congressional Representative for Virginia. I'm not going to say anything and get mad about this. I'm just going to leave it there. Mr. Griffiths expressed himself very well. And I'm now going to go on to uh, Dr. Robert Redfield, who, of course, led the CDC during the bulk of the, the pandemic. Let's hear from Mr. Redfield now, uh, Dr. Redfield now, himself a virologist uh, from a recent uh, TV interview. Dr. Robert Redfield led the CDC when the COVID outbreak began in 2020. He was an early proponent of the lab leak theory. Last March, he testified before Congress that he was sidelined over that belief. Dr. Redfield, thanks so much for joining us. I just want to get your reaction to these State Department documents. Well, Elizabeth, I think it's really important uh, that the Biden administration uh, 
follow through. I mean, Congress unanimously voted, and they do very few things unanimous, voted to have all these documents declassified. Uh, and I do think once they are declassified, the American public will get a much better understanding of the knowledge base we have. Clearly, the FBI was able to look through this material and come, you know, with modern certainty that this came from a lab, the Energy Department, low certainty. I might argue that the few agencies that say it was a natural spillover are all with low certainty. Yeah. And a number of agencies, as you know, like the CIA and the State Department, have just been, they've made no opinion. But, but Dr. I think Dr. it's really critical. I mean, I, why, why is, wouldn't they make this public? I don't understand all the secrecy around this. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I can't. I mean, I've obviously reviewed the classified information, and I'm anxious to see it all declassified. Some of it has been. Uh, I think, uh, obviously, there's geopolitical reasons that they're keeping this uh, uh, classified. I don't think it's, it's warranted it should be declassified. Weintraub's providing great leadership in this space. I think he's going to get to the truth. Uh, I mean, I'm disappointed. I saw one of your guest on before me from Johns Hopkins where he said, you know, the bulk of evidence is still spillover. I would, as a reporter, I would ask him, could you list that evidence? Yeah, no, actually. Because the actually, truth is, there's no evidence. No. There's no, there's no evidence for spillover. None. And there's plenty of evidence. There's a, lot of opi there's a lot of opinion for spillover, but there's no evidence for it. And there is a lot of evidence for the laboratory uh, leak uh, hypothesis. Yeah, we, I have never, we, have never found, we have never found an animal from that wet market or in China that was carrying That's that right. virus. Right. So uh, there is no, right. there is and, no. And, 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 yeah, and it's also important, like when SARS came in in 2002, 2003, from a bat to a civet cat, then it went to humans. It never learned how to go human to human. And MERS in 2012-13, from a bat to a camel to humans, it never learned how to go to human to human. Normally there's a species barrier that takes a long time for these zoonotic viruses to figure out how to get around. Mm -hmm. But when COVID started, it was immediately, I say, the most second most infectious virus for man that we've ever seen. This virus was obviously educated how to infect man. And we know there's a paper in 2014, 2015, where the scientists actually published that they were able to teach COVID how to bind to the ACE2 receptor in humanized mice and, and infect human right. tissue. Right, they, they were so doing- So it's just very disappointing, there's not honesty. Yeah, they were doing at this Wuhan lab gain of function research, which is yeah. when you manipulate these viruses to make them highly transmissible right. to humans and then try and come up with a vaccine to stop it. And of course, it, it, the theory here, and you, something you have always uh, believed, is that there was a mistake, an accident at the lab, and somehow that virus leaked out. You, this raises real ethical questions about this gain of function research happening in labs, not just in Wuhan, but around the world. Um, you think they should all be stopping this? Yeah, I wrote an op ed with Mark Siegel in the uh, Wall Street Journal a little while back, really calling for a moratorium on gain-of-function research. I think it puts our world at great risk. Um, we have the risk of natural spillover, but there is a species barrier. I'm obviously most worried about bird flu. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, it takes five amino acid change uh, for it to be effectively infecting humans. That's a pretty heavy species barrier. But th this virus is already now in 26 mammal species, as you saw most recently, cattle. Um, but, but in the laboratory, I could make it highly infectious for humans in months, because it's been wow. published the f uh, five amino acids that I need to change. And so I don't think that research should be done. That's the real threat. That's the real biosecurity threat that these university labs are doing these bio, uh, bio experiments that are intentionally modifying viruses. And bird flu, I think, is going to be the cause of the great pandemic, uh, where they are teaching these viruses how to be more infectious for humans. All right. Yes or no answer. Will we? I know you believe it was a lab leak. Do you think we will ever know for sure? Absolutely. I hope so. Boy, do I hope so. Because scientists like you need to better protect all of us. And uh, this is the key to knowing that. We have to know how this started and spread. Wow, it looks like the director of the CDC was sidelined. I mean, I would have thought that's a pretty senior person to be sidelined. So who could do that? I don't know. FBI and the Energy Department seem to agree. He calls for declassification. No evidence for a spillover event, but there is evidence for a lab leak event. 
Uh, he said the virus was obviously educated. It hit the ground running, as it were, very infectious from the, the offset. There's a publication history of development of work on this sort of viruses. Uh, he's disappointed there's not honesty. He calls for a monitorium to stop gain of function research. And of course, um, we do the same. We need to stop this because he says the world is at great risk. This is Dr. Robert Redfield saying the world is at great risk. The next great pandemic, you believe, is going to be influenza. Five amino acid changes would do the trick and make it highly transmissible to humans. He could do that himself quite readily in a few months in a lab. And yet we've got university level labs uh, experimenting on this. And uh, who knows, they may have already changed those five amino acids already. If they have, let's hope it doesn't leak. Let's hope they haven't, but if they have, let's hope it doesn't leak. Um, um, because there's going to be another influenza pandemic. And maybe we have to ask ourselves. Who would that be bad for? And maybe even who would that be good for? I'll leave it at that. Thank you for watching.